Okay, back at it, team. Ooh, uh. Okay, so this is chapter 12 and scene size up. And there's a lot of important information in here that will help protect you when you get on, hopefully get to a scene, um, either on your ride outs or when you actually are out there on your own with a partner. And these are some of the things we're going <clears> to <throat> look at here. Determining your scene safety, your personal protection, which will go above and beyond the mask, uh, goggles, and gloves and stuff. Uh, determining the nature and the number of patients. Now, it sounds really easy, but they're not. Uh, totally not. And I'll get into that. Because um, there's a lot of very strange things that happen on happens on calls or can happen on calls. Just remember, you're in an uncontrolled environment. And you're trying to make, you know, order out of chaos. Um, and then if you don't recognize that there are hazards on the scene, you can end up part of the problem, meaning um, your unit or whatever vehicle you're in or you yourself may pay with your own life or um, you know, be injured you know, in some way. So paying close attention to what's going on there is really important. Now, dispatch is only going to give you a certain amount of information, as much as what they can get out of somebody. And it's not always 100% accurate, which again, Julio, my friend, that is first pediatric full rest and his partner, neither of them had one before, but they weren't ready for it. They didn't tell them. They just said, you know, a, a child, you know, a child was injured or a child's not doing well or a child with a breathing problem. Well, it wasn't. It was a little baby. So anyway, once you get on scene, your safety is, you know, super important and it's dynamic. Uh, it can change. At first, it might seem safe and that can change on scene. So you have to have situational awareness all the time you're at any anyone's home, business for an emergency, out on a highway or byway with a tra uh, traumatic incident. You got to get the hazards down, like what's going to be hazardous to you. And we're going to walk through some of those, determine the nature of the problem and recognize the need for any additional um, resources. So you're doing your scene size up, trying to get an uh, idea. So in the three basic goals, and it looks like a test question. Your three basic goals, identify hazards in a scene size up determine the nature of the problem, and recognize the need for additional resources. Those are, you know, three big things associated with your scene size up. So you're already going to take your precautions that you're going in with. If you're with an ambulance service, obviously you're going to have your gloves on and the availability to have, you know, other personal protective equipment to add to it and looking for any safety hazards. As you're going up, mechanism of injury or illness, what, why did you get brought to that certain situation? How many patients do you have and do you need other resources? So the determination for the additional resources can be based on the incident. If it's a single person, single illness, you know, um, in uh, medical uh, problem or complaint like chest pain or stroke, you may only need you and your partner and then maybe a fire unit, one squad. If it's a traffic collision uh, involving more than one car, uh, you may need uh, fire service for extrication, fire suppression, um, you know, different things like that and, and help with multiple patients. This has become more uh, prominent now violence towards ems and fire not you know ems fire and police the violence towards ems personnel in the free hospital environment has increased you know significantly in the last several years and the preceding 12 months 69 percent of ems personnel studied have had experienced some form of violence now there's some back east that were the EMS personnel were actually shot at and some were killed. 
And one was shot at and killed, and this guy blew up some his old folks' home he was in. But you know, it's an austere environment you're getting into and, and maybe dealing with. And just recognize that and be again, have your situational awareness. Understand what's going on around you. Um, and I'll, there's a picture with a big crowd, and I'll get into that too, because I was in one of those once at the, the east end of Riverside, and that was pretty pretty intense. So now let's go above and beyond your p standard PPEs that you would have as an ambulance person. So uh, complex breathing apparatus, helmets, fire service helmets for protection, and then other gear might be heavy duty gloves and boots, what we call, we call bunker boots. And again, um, all of these are, are used usually by fire service or extrication personnel. There are some ambulance services that have rescue com combination ambulances. They have some up here. They're huge, absolutely huge vehicles. Um, they probably get one mile to the gallon. But they have extrication gear, lots of different types of heavy extrication gear, plus they can transport as an ambulance. So pretty impressive. Uh, and I know back east they're using a lot of those too. But on this, this side of the world, typically what you see is your box ambulance or your van ambulance and then fire service with a squad response or an engine response. So you can't go into a scene as a as a ambulance provider with your standard just uniform and a pair of gloves and you know stuff like that if you're going to an extrication scene you should have the same level as the firefighters if you intend to participate now let me give you an example look right here so they have well the hamatro tools you know uh, you might know more as like a jaws type device cutters and spreaders then what they're doing is removing the top of the, um, this person's car so they can get them out safely. The guy on the very left with a white uh, backboard, and he has he has a reflective vest, but he only has like a T-shirt on or a polo shirt and, and just regular pants and boots. He has no helmet, has no protective gear. If you look at the fire guys, they have all these very thick turnouts and helmets to protect their head, huge, you know, thick boots. So if something were to happen, um, you know, they're protect, they have some level of protection. The red helmet is a guy in charge of that scene. So scene safety is an assessment of the scene to ensure safety for everyone there. So a question might be worded, you know, you do scene safety, who's it for? Well, you primarily, your scene safety is, you're the primary person, take care of yourself first, take care of your patient, and then your bystanders. Okay, so in that order. So super important because you can't work on anybody if, you know, you've got a broken leg or a broken arm or you lose one of your fingers in a scene, you know, get hurt yourself. And guess what? It happens. So we want to make sure that you're thinking that way and protecting yourself first and then go down um, down the, um, the path of helping, you know, getting to the patient, getting them taken care of, and then the bystanders. Uh, now, I like they said, consider dispatch information. It's not always accurate, and it's not always um, a lot and forthcoming. So, again, anticipate... Um, that there are some missing missing information. A uh, case in point, um, it's, it's February 5th. A case in point would have been about the week of January 21st. No, it was earlier than that. The week of the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th of January. In that area, uh, dispatch rolled our guys into a scene that they really had no business being in. It was a man with difficulty breathing. Well, it was no, it was a guy with it, what they called uh, uh, not delirium tremens. Um, he's where he was out of totally out of out of control, um, you know, on something out of control with family, 
you know, they're trying to calm him down. Our guys get on scene. He's threatening to kill people. Don't touch him. Leave him alone. Um, excited delirium is what it's called. And they're kind of a special case in that if you got to be careful about how you restrain them, because if you restrain them wrong, they die. Poof, like that. They go into cardiac arrest. And so they got that going on. And then there's like 12, 14 people outside where you got an ambulance parked on a fire truck. And now there's a big fight that breaks out with those people. I'm not sure the exact relationship they had with what was going on in the house. But now you got this big riot going on. So they got put in the middle of it. And this is what we don't want you, you know, to get put in. Basically, it should have just backed out uh, of the scene, got out of there. And um, let cops come in and handle it. Okay. So you might need it when you determine what your needs are. You might need heavy rescue, hazardous materials team, um, water rescue, high angle rescue. There's also another one they should have put in here, um, trench rescue, which every so often our guys do a trench rescue. Uh, if you have a place where there's a lot of building going on and, and construction. You have a lot of potential for that. Wires down pose a big threat. Um, one of our battalion chiefs, not at the department I'm at now, my previous department, was out on the fires <clears throat> up north somewhere, and he leaned up against a fence, not realizing that the wire was touching the fence on the other side of the house, and it electrified the fence, and he touched the fence and got shocked. <laughs> funny but if you knew him it was funny anyway <clears throat> he was very lucky in that he didn't get a full whack when he got got shocked but he did get uh it woke him up really well so um what i'm saying is is we'll get a little bit more to you know down wires but one of the things with down wires is you need to be minimally 60 feet minimum from where the wires contact um the ground that means that's your safety zone so if all those guys are standing there and all of a sudden the same that electricity comes back through this line okay that means they're all going to be electrified if you lift your foot your toast if you um i mean literally you end up getting chalked um, so what the guys, and I was just speaking to one uh, up here that does the, 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 all the lectures for the electrical company. I was talking to him and he goes, yeah, if that happens, do not lift your foot. You shuffle. You keep your both feet in contact and you shuffle your carcass greater, 60 feet or greater away from where the, those down lines are at. Because if you lift one, you're done. If you're in the car and you step out, your toast. So anyway, we tell people with their lines might be down around them that that is considered electrified until the electrical company responsible for that line, you know, shuts off the power to it. One thing you might not understand about those, if, you know, here the power lines are severed, they're on the ground, oh, there's no power. Well, initially there is, and then it shuts off. And then what happens is it reroutes itself through what they call a grid. And that grid is designed to take up the slack if somebody loses power then finds another way to get to that area to service that area. And that would might be you where you have that down power line. So, again, I, I don't know about you, but my introduction to Murrieta and power like that, it was a similar incident and it was it was terrible. Um, guy ran a boom up into a power line killed him he was only 18 first day on the job and the other guy he was working with was training him heavy equipment operator you know worked on him not not the operator but worked on him both of them got electrified with thousands of volts of the line overhead that was quote off the guy that went to help him touch the vehicle it was touching one of the other vehicles that was electrified we went to get his touch the fire extinguisher it blew his hands with burns on his hands and blew him back and knocked him out. He was the only one that survived. So I have a very healthy um, respect for electricity, and I would hope you would too. Okay, so consider your characteristics. Do not enter an unstable crash scene. I've seen people do that. It's like, oh my goodness, what are you thinking? Because what happens is you have to slow down, wait, have them chalk, 
the vehicle and, and secure the vehicle so it's not going to roll away on you. Um, we were up in above in the Iowa area on a traffic collision, and one of our guys got in and I was like, "Hey, wait till the engine gets here," because we were in the ambulance. We beat him, and he gets in and the stinking thing is on ice and starts rolling away. Literally, I can just take the vehicle and push it. This huge truck. So you use your head when you're on some of these scenes down there, um, and you can go anywhere. Um, wet weather, icy weather, make sure that you're thinking about your safety. You might have, again, wait for the police or in any volatile scene, and you're wanting to go in there and help the people that are down, but it doesn't go help you to go in there and get hurt or beat up or stabbed or shot. Um, again, if you're at a home or somewhere where it becomes unstable and uh, you know, you're going to be in a fight, get out. Make sure you have all your calling devices, your portable radio, and radio your code for needing officers' help. Um, and a lot of places will have a soup, you know, some kind of a, you know, I have a code whatever here, code blue or code red. I need, you know, PD right away. So some uh, code saying that, hey, I need help or, you know, potential for physical harm. So again, from crashes, vehicles, just as a reminder, um, I'm done with the power lines, a reminder, any vehicle that has been crushed and leaking fuel still has the um, batteries that have not been disengaged, usually by fire service, um, that have the same materials in that situation as a bomb. And, and that's a car. So you got this fuel leaking out, you got this electrical source, you got a, a fuel source, um, you have a potential for, you know, a rapid accelerant and sometimes violent explosion, depending on the temperature and how that stuff aerosolizes. Again, here's, again, somebody strikes a, a utility pole and the power start, lines start coming down or dropping down. So this person here is in jeopardy. Hazardous materials. You know, you don't, you know, you look at these jugs, but you have no idea what's in them. They're in level A suits for a reason. Those suits are what's called totally encapsulated, self-contained breathing apparatuses. They have actually two different types of monitoring equipment to try and figure out what uh, is in those 55 gallon drums. I was working in the ANZA area, we do a lot of busts up there. What we knew, knew is that the manufacturers of the methamphetamine and some of the other things they were manufacturing, they take these drums and dump them, empty them out on the Indian land or they'll just leave the drums and you know, all the fluids leaking out. And there would literally be areas that were green, you know, a radius from that drum of about 30, 40 feet, just turned totally brown, everything in it destroyed. And then find out it's a byproduct from a meth lab. So, and you don't want to get any of that stuff on you because you have no idea um, what type of substance that is. It could be mutagenic, me teratogenic or carcinogenic mutation uh tumor producing cancers producing so some chemical again it doesn't take much of an exposure to end up with bad things that happen to you in crime scenes choose one person to go in if the cops want you to evaluate a body or somebody which is what they have over here i don't know if you can see them over there laying down i think it's prone um, you know, we see that ha that happen where we want you to go check and make sure to see if this guy's viable or not. Only send in one person with a you know monitor, or one person if you don't have a monitor to do the check, looking for vital signs or potential to you might be able to save the guy. If not, what happens is if you only put one guy in there, you don't destroy the destroy the scene very much. Your shoes are probably going to get cast. Um, I've had mine cast before uh, to see who's been on that scene it, and they're going to determine footprints and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, you just don't want to clutter up a crime scene. These guys think a little bit different than the detectives. Um, I've been yelled at by a detective and luckily you know, he figured out it wasn't my fault. It was another guy's um, and turned on him. You know, it was a physician, actually. 
okay, here's an unstable situation. You don't get in there to get to the driver in, in this kind of a situation without this thing being stabilized. And it's require a lot of heavy rescue equipment to get this thing stabilized. And then you can get to the guy inside the cab. Reason the fire department wear the big jackets is any metal jack, any metal, sharp metal jagged edges or broken glass, they're a threat to you. And um, those, those turnouts will protect them from that. Um, been there, done that. Um, I made the mistake of taking off my helmet once and getting into a car to try to help hold stabilization of someone's spine. But as I was crawling in, I hit my head on the top where there was glass in the window still. After, you know, punching it, all the little glass beads come down. When I went in, it got me right in the top of the head. So I had glass on my head for a long time. So that was like, oh, man, a dumb thing to do. That it was hard to get in there without taking off my helmet. Undeployed airbags, you can, if you're in the front there, or now even the side airbags, <clears throat> depending on what type of vehicle, if those aren't disengaged or de-energized, those things can go off at any time post-accident if they haven't gone off. And sometimes that happened. That happened to an accident my wife was in. Her bags in her Chevy did not deploy. And uh, <clears throat> again, at any time they can now deploy. Fuel leaking, ignition source, I already talked about that, and fire, and then any hazardous materials you might get exposed to. Um, moving traffic is a scary thing. Um, yeah, they have you have the vest. I think they have you have the vest because once you get hit at night and you go flying through the air uh, 100 feet by a tr drunk driving through your accident scene, they can at least find you a little easier or at least most of your pieces. Uh, that happened to a good friend of mine, um, Bob, on the 15 freeway near Clinton Heath, where a drunk drove through their scene, and somebody yelled, and he was able to jump up. Lucky he didn't go over him. He jumped up. He went up and over the vehicle and rolled over the top. He ended up in the hospital for months, uh, all broken. He finally got back to work a year later, and he just retired yesterday or the day before. So, again... These accident scenes, you better have a situational awareness. You need a safety officer or somebody watching your butt as traffic is being diverted. Um, and if you see any, you know, people coming through driving erratically, yeah, just get out of the way. Yeah, your patient might get run over, but if you can at least get out of the way so you don't get run over with them. And that's what happened to his patient. She ended up getting run over by the drunk. He ended up going up and over the vehicle. So it finished her off. If you do as much work, not out of, in the traffic, but out of it, meaning relocating the patient away to a more safer area. Um, what I've done is brought them over to the other side of the guardrails and worked them in the middle. So that way you have those guardrails protecting you and they do you know, a pretty good job. But we now use a fire engine to um, angle and protect you when you're on a scene like that and it'll go over one or two lanes so a highway patrol or whoever will have to divert the traffic um, so you hit a you know it's going to take a lot um, to move that fire engine full of water so most conventional vehicles and small you know suvs and vehicles are going to hit that fire truck and bounce off um, now big rig a little bit a little bit of a difference there hopefully he's not driving sleepy <clears throat> so just again re remember you're going to be asked to park at, a, at an accident scene so parking um, your vehicle at an accident scene you want to make sure you're at an area you can get in and out and not box yourself in remember at some rescue scenes um, you might have to have some specialized equipment especially if there's a chemical, biological, or some nuclear thing um, going on. And, you know, like the CBRNE, um, chemical, biological, nuclear, explosive, weapons, all this other stuff. And that's still a possibility that you can end up in one of those scenes. Heights, natural disasters, underground areas. So all these require special rescue and special training and special equipment. Uh, this is a prevalent one here. Um, 
they just had a, well, it's ice recovery. Uh, some guys going, you know, on the ice and ice still thin um, in some, pl some places and they went falling right through. I don't think any of them made it if I remember correctly. So unfortunately, that's a, a scene you don't want to get caught in right here without special protection. This is a worst case scenario. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but this is not just for the people that are they're rescuing, but for the rescuers themselves. You know, you better have a really healthy respect for water. If you can look back here, all that water coming through, that's power like you can't believe. So they're rescuing these kids out of here, but you also have a potential for you to get injured too. Um, Cave-in rescues, storage tank rescues, silo rescues, uh, farm equipment. Silo rescues, they've got a lot of those up here. There are some down there in the Paris area and in the Hemet area where they stored grain. And you do not want to fall into one of those. It's like falling into quicksand. Okay, so suffocation hazard. Any sparks in some of those bins will actually explode because of the gases that are off-gassing from those, um, whatever it is, you know, barley, wheat, whatever they uh, have stored in there, grain-wise, uh, is, is a, how it has a potential also, the gas that off-gasses there. So just remember there are places like up here, unstable surfaces and slopes, um, down there, same if you're going up Cranston, up towards Idlewild, there's some places there that are um, slippery, hard, angled, cars go over the edge. You might be a part of helping to get that person up and over. So make sure you have good boots. Um, water, unless you've been thoroughly trained, you better have a healthy respect for water. And even if you are trained, those guys and gals really know what they're doing and be able to rescue some people from, you know, type, certain types of moving water, water, swift water rescue. I know Marietta has a really good team. They just used it recently, again, rescuing people. Tanker spills, pipeline ruptures. Again, you might find you, you guys and gals may end up in one of those in an ambulance. Could be on your... You know, never know. It might be on your time you're doing on the units, or you might be in the ER and they're getting people that have been exposed to some of the tanker spill or different types of rupture and chemicals. Uh, we'd like to get them decontaminated before you get to them in the ER. And then you might end up doing vital signs. It might have you gown up and do vital signs on some of them if there's a large exposure. So toxic or confined space environments, small confined pla places. Um, we'd have people go down manholes, kids, um, tunnels, you know, big pipes. And then there's a decay of organic substance and it replaces the air inside there, disperses the oxygen and actually replaces it with methane. Another one would be sulfur, di sulfur dioxide, nasty sulfur, rotten egg smell. Um, those are deadly to, to sniff into your into your body. Clandestine drug labs. Take a look at the. These are the things they're using in them. Now, ephedrine's kind of hard to get now. Um, sources they used to get them from was Mexico. Um, I'm not sure if it's still coming over here for the manufacturer, but they are using other stuff because they're still manufacturing. Uh, methamphetamine like it was going out of business and uh, Riverside County we were the kind of the top leaders in the country but now um, very interestingly enough a lot of these labs have moved to rural areas out in so they're not bothered as much about doing their manufacturing because um, nobody's out there Okay, so Okay, so which is not a goal of the scene side though? Yeah. 
Anybody got a shot at it? Is it A? Yeah, I would. That was what I would. I would guess. Yeah. There you go. Correct. Very good. So, scene size up. Determine the safety of the scene to determine the nature of the problem. Determine the need for additional resources. Excellent. Okay. Um, just a little bit more. They will once you'll know a little bit more crime scenes. A lot of times they'll tell you to turn your lights and sirens off before you get. They'll say turn them off two week two blocks before or one block before or whatever. Don't come in with lights and sirens. Um, again, if you come in and you're supposed to be cops there and they're not, you got the right address. Back out and don't park in front of the actual crime scene itself. You know, park a couple houses away. I would also lock my vehicle. Don't leave your keys in it. I think it was AMR or Simon, somebody recently in the Corona area. Was it Corona or Wildemar? Lake Elsinore area got their ambulance taken again. Um, anyway, so austere environments. Large crowds. Um, be very aware of large crowds. They can become rowdy and they don't care who you are, what uniform. To them, sometimes all uniforms are cops, especially if they're dark uniforms. So in the crime, typically what they like you to do is they want you to walk in the grass, not the sidewalk, uh, because a lot of times perpetrators, you know, use the sidewalk and they might drop stuff and they don't want you kicking, pushing, pushing destroying any evidence hold your flashlight out in front of you but off to the side so if somebody decides to shoot the light they're shooting not at your body core but they're shooting at the air or they might get your arm at least they don't get your chest um careful yeah you can walk single file that's always an interesting thing i kind of like staggered um you know at least Staggers so if somebody shoots and it doesn't go through three of you all at once with one bullet. Now there's a difference between concealment and cover, meaning there's something you can hide behind something and it just conceals you, and then there's cover where it actually will stop bullets. Um, so for example, we think that a refrigerator would stop, you know, bullets. Well, they really don't stop. They can stop a 22, but they can't stop a nine millimeter or a 357 or a 38 or a 45. They go right through a refrigerator like it was butter. Okay. Um, a, a door of a car is not, I repeat, not cover. You can't, it, everything will go through it. Even 22 bullets will go through a door. So I would be very, very um, aware of what you're standing behind and don't don't get into the. Uh, thank you, Josh. Don't get into the situation of, of saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to get behind my car door. You know, you see this stuff on TV where, you know, these movies where they get behind a car door and it's full of holes and they're standing right there and they're returning fire. I'm like, that is so unrealistic. I actually have a film. I'll see if I can find the disc. I'm, I'm not, since I moved, I have everything still in boxes, most things. Um, i show you what I was given by the Sheriff's Department. I put, I put it on a disc, and I wanted you to see it. It tells you what you can can't hide behind, what's safe and what's not. Um, and again, people, uh, people do these, you know, late learn from Hollywood on, you know, what to do. It's totally unrealistic. Okay, again, I already told you, secure, you know, limit the responders, usually one. Um, don't allow bystanders, anyone to disturb stuff. Introduce yourself to the patient. Again, you never know, the patient could be the perpetrator. Have somebody watch the area. We call it a safety officer. And then somebody does the medical assistance, if it's appropriate, meaning that if you're not going to get yourself with your head bashed in, shot, stabbed. So have the police, you know, do your security. Uh, don't touch any weapons, anything that's suspect that might have been used as a weapon. Always wear gloves the entire time. We do not cut 
this is a pet peeve of detectives, man. You want to get in trouble, cut through a bullet hole or an iPhone. Um, also, cutting, uh, don't ever cut the rope at the knot. You always cut the rope away from the knot. There's a reason for that. Don't burden people. You're not a detective, so you shouldn't you know, be doing their work for them. Focus on what you need to do. So he's got his away from him as far as his flashlight. And a good idea because a lot of times people, they'll just shoot. They'll shoot at the light and may or may not get his arm. But if you hold the light here, you know, you're dead meat. Okay. Now these guys look like they're single file. Again, I kind of like the staggered, you know, off shoulder. So if it does go through him, might not get me behind him. I try to put the bigger guy in front. It's always a good idea. Just kidding. Uh, this is how you knock on a door because um, we've had people pull guns on us at, at scenes going, you know, I didn't call you. Who are you? And, you know, the guy is probably not the best, not the best neighborhood with not the best, um, you know, whatever he was doing inside is probably not good. Anyway, um, so it wouldn't be uncommon to have somebody call you to somebody's home that's a druggie or um, not a good person just to harass him. But that puts you in jeopardy. We've had that happen before. Barroom scenes. Oh, man, those are fun. That would be narco. Um, post rodeo, everyone drunk. And, you know, big cowboy puts his number 12 boot and little, you know, little guy uh, because he was making a crack about his wife. So you got to remember that big size 12 boot pointy toe going into your stomach or chest of the little guy with a big mouth um, could do a lot of damage. Like it lacerated his liver and the second kick broke a bunch of ribs and gave him a flail segment. And the third one caught him in the crotch and he had testicles the size of basketballs so anyway um this are the scenes you do when to stay out because again you know people consuming alcohol drugs become unpredictable and you become potentially a target um again verbal or threats just back out don't escalate let them talk smack do whatever they want let the cops handle it they get paid more they're got more protective stuff they got more ways of dealing with rowdy people than you do uh, passenger cars park at least one car length behind the vehicle and turn your wheel so they go up against a curve to keep it from rolling away if some weird thing should happen um, try to reflect your high beams off the rear view mirror good idea and again, get a license plate if you can. So again, if you're something strange went on in that passenger vehicle and the occupants, you might want to be able to retreat back as quickly as you can. If you aren't able to control anything outside, then bring them into your ambulance to control that patient in your situation. Um, a lot of people like to work in people's homes, and it's good if it's a stable environment. If it's an unstable environment, you get them out of the home. So protecting um, your patient and yourself are the utmost issues that you want to take care of. So removing them from the scene is probably the best. Um, Keeping the cat crowd out of your out of your hair can be very challenging. That's why I like to show this next one. <clears throat> this is a similar situation we had in the East End of Riverside. It turned into actually turned into a riot. So as I pull up on scene, there are people everywhere. You know, hear a few pops, and then you know, suddenly a couple things hit our vehicle. So we pulled over and found one person that was laying in the street picked him up, he was probably 160 pounds, and there was a blood, you know, coming out of his left thigh area. He had been shot. We literally lifted him up, threw him in the back of the ambulance, um, onto the gurney. I got in the back and the department drove off. We found two bullet holes in our vehicle. So 
<clears throat> moral to the story is again situational awareness pe people running people fighting people rowdy people drinking you know you know it's a bad situation for everybody you're trying to create a workable environment in a chaotic situation so yeah move furniture move the patient if you have to to be able to work on them you know i've been in people's homes Grandma's laying down, cardiac arrest, and the kids are still watching TV. It's blaring loud, and nobody's doing anything. It's like, whoa, is this for real? So you're going to see situations like that. Um, I've seen people drive into rest for Sherry's Restaurant in Hemet when it was there. Literally, the car went in. It went over the table onto two people. They're trapped underneath in bad shape, and the, everyone around them is still eating and watching the show. We literally had to remove them out of there because we couldn't get the, we had to get to where we could turn off the car because it was spewing carbon monoxide inside the Sherry's restroom. So you're going to find yourself in some very interesting situations. So control the scene, stay calm, be tactful, and diplomatic, don't lose your cool, be flexible, open minded, alert, compassionate. Um, if people can see you in that manner, you may have, again, unless they're drugs and alcohol skewing them, you may have a much better um, um, potential for um, dealing with a situation safely. I was in one situation where we went to pick up, uh, there was a drive-by, you know, we're worried about another, another one coming by, got on scene, really super nice, got to the guy, got shot shovel in his chest, hey, I'm gonna take care of, good care of you, man. Um, his gang, Banger friends basically surrounded our vehicle and protected us. Said, you know, we'll, you know, brother, we'll, be, we'll protect you. You know, that guy might come back around and I often do that you know, around here. That was, uh, you know, another part of Riverside. So that was a welcome thing. So got the guy to the hospital and he lived. But um, again, if you walk in and you're doing all these calm, tactful, flexible, compassionate, alert, and you want to help, no matter who they are, you may find yourself with some added protection. But still be vigilant and keep your situational awareness. Now, it may be trauma, or it may be medical, it may be both. So which happened first? Um, sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. So again, you have the physical injury and the force caused might have been because they blacked out. Okay, so, and we've had that happen where the guy has a stroke, ran into a tree. Not only did he have a stroke, he also had, you know, part of his lip missing, he ate the steering wheel, his lips were all jacked up, teeth were kind of falling out. You know, we had to keep him suction. It was a pretty interesting call. Um, found out he didn't have, you know, he was paralyzed on his left side. So, Going to the trauma center, we had not only do we have a trauma patient, we also did have an elderly stroke patient at the same time. So, determine your mechanism of injury. And then, when you're talking about mechanism of injury, is you know the strength or the power and the direction of the forces. The use of mechanism of injury gives you a good index suspicion of the injuries meaning that if they're going at 30 miles an hour and they strike that immovable tree, okay, the, that force and physics uh, on that person also is going to have some determining factors related to the car they're using. If it's a modern car with new bag systems, they're probably going to do really well. They're going to have some injuries from the bags. Um, but when those bags deploy, they don't deploy a second time. And the person, if he gets hit by another vehicle, they end up sustaining injuries. You know, uh, say that the vehicle that hit him, he's stationary, hits him at 40 miles an hour. That's a mechanism of injury. It's going to co cause severe injury to that person or persons inside that vehicle. If it's a head on and both of them are doing 40 miles an hour, and it's a head-on collision, that combined collision is 80 miles an hour now. So now you have higher physics and more 
um, injury potential associated with that seam. So again, some, the highest index of suspicions are from falls, okay? And for um, us, meaning adults, it's um, greater than 20 feet. Motor vehicle accidents or crashes um, yield some really good mechanisms and injury potential. Recreational vehicles, crashes, um, and contact sports, or recreational sports. Pedestrians stuck by vehicles, shooting, stabbings, Pedestrians stuck by vehicles usually do one of two things. You do an up and over or a down and under. And it depends on how big the vehicle, how high it is. If it's a, if it's a Miata and you should walk out in front of it, you're going to go up and over. If you walk out in front of a F-350 four-wheel drive race pickup, you're going down and under. If you're talking about being a pedestrian hit by a vehicle. Explosions, <clears throat> we'll get into the different levels of those. That's in a different different um, section along with shootings and stabbings. Burns, again, go along with explosions or just chemical, fire, electrical mechanism. <clears throat> now we wanna know the distance, the surface they landed on and the body part they hit first. If your head hits first, even smaller distances can be, uh, give you a really good mechanism of injury as far as head injury goes. So, in motor vehicle crashes, you need to know that you have these five uh, five levels: head-on or frontal collisions, rear-end collisions, what they call side or lateral collisions. We call them T-bones, um, but side or lateral is the actual name of it. Rotational impact and collision, and then rollovers. So, show you some examples of those after the break, um, a couple examples, and get the, the lecture finished off. But um, those different types of collisions each have mechanisms associated with them. So I would know what those collisions are and the associated mechanisms of injuries with them, because you're going to be um, evaluating some of those and what injuries are associated with them. Go ahead and take 10 more minutes, and I'll find these um, couple of my um, videos that show some of these different types of collisions for you. Okay, take 10 minutes. <clears throat> and I will try to find them. Okay, let's find the videos.
Yes, love. Where did that one go? Hmm. I think it's this one. Oh, there it is, right there. That was quick. Okay, I'm gonna put that one down there. That's the one I want. Okay. There's no sound on this one. Let me. Oop. Hope this doesn't screw anything up. I've still got peel.
Okay, team, let's finish this. Let's get moving. Okay, so this is a mechanism of injury, one of them. I'll, I've got just, just a couple to show you. Uh, pay particular attention to the person in the, in the crosswalk. Okay, so what you have, no, I can do it once more. What you have here is look at the different mechanisms. You have auto versus pedestrian, that's quite obvious. You have a T-bone, and then you have a rollover um, associated with that also. Now, I got this from one of our motor officers at, at Marietta. Um, this was over near Cal State Ford, and, and the guy survived. He was kind of messed up, but he did survive. And what happened is um, the, the traffic lights malfunctioned, and that's what caused this. Um, we'll give it one more shot. Yeah, he was heading to Cal State going to school. Okay, what's well, here's a. <clears throat> Here's an ejection out of a vehicle. Now, if you see all the stuff flying out of his vehicle, <clears throat> All that stuff was money. Uh, there was lots of money and other types of papers he had in there. He had just robbed a bank, killed one of the guards, and the helicopter was a CHP helicopter on the 10 free 10 freeway, 10 freeway following him, and they were calling this karma. Okay, how could I go down? And one last one. Um, there we go. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> what just happened? That's called job guarantee because that could have been uh, a worst outcome, not a good outcome to that. I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of machinery. And no, that was not Montana. That was Oklahoma. So if you're from Oklahoma, I'm sorry. But you guys and gals are going to see such crazy stuff. I mean, it is really, it's really a neat um, environment, in my opinion. And again, oh, here's a real simple mechanism, and then I'll get back and finish. <laughs> Yeah. 
you know, you're not there to see it, but you get on scene and you pick up all the pieces, you know, men and women. Okay, so let's let's get this finished. <clears throat> okay, so then the motor vehicle collisions, deformity greater than 20 inches, meaning in the rear in, rear or front intrusion. I gotta fix this. Blink. Rear, you need to remember that because that much impact into the modern vehicles is a highly significant amount of trauma to the vehicle um, and in physics. So into that uh, passenger uh, compartment. Um, now the passenger compartment, most of them say 16 inches into the passenger compartment. So what, what that's talking about, if you're sitting there driving and somebody hits you from the side, that 16 inches has gone, that has basically been in your side. That car and your vehicle and that car's bumper has come in and it's been in you for a split second. Okay. Uh, displacement of the axle is a lot of power and then rollovers, a lot of power too. Um, that is in, in physics and impacts and shearing and tearing forces. Um, marks on the windshield, we call them spiders, spider webs. Um, hopefully they have a, an example here. Um, missing uh, missing rear view mirror means you knocked, your, knocked it off with your head. Collapsed steering wheels means you did that with your chest. And then actually a broken seat. Again, there's a lot of, lot of um, power and a lot of force. So side door damage we talked about, cracked or damaged as sports, usually doing it with your knees or your body. Deformed pedals, use of restraint devices and deployment of airbags. Um, though they're not mechanisms of injuries, those have restrained you. And there's, there are several levels of collision uh, when you talk about mechanism of injury. Anyone ejected um, out of a vehicle uh, has some in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 percent higher potential for dying than if you're restrained in your vehicle. Death or significant injury of another occupant in the same vehicle. So you and I go to head to Taco Bell for something to eat. Some, you know, we're doing 40 miles an hour and some drunk, crazy guy crosses over and hits us at 60. I die, you don't. Both restrained, both same types of restraint systems you have a very high potential of having significant injury, enough injury to kill you as it did me. So, um, yeah, you go directly to a trauma center. Um, well, that's car, that's, I don't think they would use a better um, video or a better picture than that. I've got better ones. Okay. Um, so what is it? Determine MOI. Um, impact. Patient wearing a helmet, was it head on? Was he up and over? Angular impact? Did he have to lay the bob the bike down? This is a very significant problem in, in the um heaven area because a lot of the drivers around there, elderly, they don't see but they're still driving. And they'll pull out in front of you and then your bike, you'll hit them and you'll up and over and you'll get the double 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 femur fracture because you're hitting both those handlebars at the same time. Your vehicle rollover crashes, we usually get some really nice crushing injuries from those uh, and impacts. We've had people clotheslined before, meaning hitting things that were stretched across, you know, roads, mm, intentional or not, who knows, but uh, in some of the cases we kind of wonder. Penetrating traumas for shooting, stabbing, exposed injuries. So any, any penetrating of the head, body, torso, um, or over areas that would have large vessels like the femoral artery are trauma criteria and mechanisms. Here's a patient that um, confirmed rule out stabbing or gunshot wound, which is it? Uh, I wouldn't know. It'd be nice to talk to the person, find out. Doesn't, I don't know. You never know what this is. I couldn't tell you. I can only tell you that is in the axillary line anterior anterior axillary line about you know six inches uh, below the mid uh, mid part of the armpit 
is a hole that would appear to be the size of a quarter, a half dollar. And that's how I would describe it. I wouldn't tell them either way. Um, I'd let them figure it out unless the patient told you what it was. Blast injuries, just remember, these are the, the four things that are associated with blast injuries. And again, we'll go into them in a little more detail in another lecture I have. But the pressure wave is significant enough pressure to pop your lungs, pop your sinuses, pop your eardrums, pop your eyeballs. Um, the flying debris from it will accelerate um, to the, the speed at which the propellant is degrading, meaning exploding, uh, depending on its C4, C3, um, uh, some of the others that are used. I'm kind of drawing a blank. Pemex. Well, anyway, yeah, it could be 22,000 feet per set, 40,000 feet per second. Yeah, these things literally fly right through you like butter, hot knife through butter and go right through you. Um, it can be any type of debris. And then it can pick up debris too as it, it's going pieces of wood, pieces of whatever, and accelerate them too. And um, you can be thrown to the ground and then associated with it, if you're close enough, you get burns also if you're close enough to the blast. Now, nature of illness is really not a diagnosis, but attempt to narrow down what the problem is. So again, you can consider information from dispatch, but the best is from the, the patient, if they know who they are, where they're at, time of day, meaning they're alert and oriented, then default to the family members and clues at the scenes become extremely important. And remember, all of your gathering of the medications, those medications tell you about what's going on inside that person. Do they have high blood pressure medicine, like lisinopril? Is there high blood pressure? Um, you know, are they taking their medicines? Is it under control? Are they taking nitroglycerin? Do they have a heart history in angina? Do they take insulin? Are they a diabetic? You know, on and on and on and on. So when you get these medicines and you know what they are, start learning some of them. So as you go along, you can go, oh, yeah, I know that's for, um, you know, that's for high blood pressure or, oh, that's for heart failure things like that. Um, so again, um, any you know drugs or alcohol use associated with that, you'd be surprised how many um, people in um, Hemet are um, in 60, 65 and are heroin addicts. I know, weird, right? But yeah, they are elderly and, and we do have some older heroin. I think the oldest I've taken care of is 69. <laughs> Um, heroin addict. You've been a heroin addict for like five or six years. So, um, and what environment are you picking them out of uh, becomes important too. Do they have heat? Do they have air conditioning? Is it the summer? No air conditioning. Is it winter and no heat? Um, that happens too. Are there multiple patients? Are the multiple patients with the same complaint? Um, is it a multi casualty incident if it's uh, an actual um, trauma associated? So scene size up is really the initial assessment, the initial part of patient assessment. It really gets you going. Um, scene size up, you evaluate the scene and you assure, you know, your safety, nature of the problem, additional resources. Then you make sure you have your own protection. Your PPEs, but physically make sure you're not going to get whacked or killed by anything. And that's really the end of it right there. Um, so just remember the difference between the def definition of tachycardia and bradycardia and um, what respiration would be normal for an adult uh, and a child and an infant. Um, and is adult or is the infant have a narrow airway? Anyone answer that one? Who has a narrow airway, the adult or the infant? Infant. Very good, excellent. And it's actually like this. It's a it's a funnel and it catches things, and they really have a hard time, you know, airway wise. Um, they they it gets lodged in that. It's like a little funnel. Okay. So that's all I have tonight. I will see you tomorrow night. We'll finish that off. I will also cover some more. Um, 
of my of the questions because this test I did not make um, questions with this test. Um, that way you kind of get a little notch of some of the ones I think are kind of odd to how they're they're um, answered or asked, and then I want to make sure you understand the answers because at least the ones I've already talked about tonight they're point towards national registry questions anyway. I want you guys to do good. I have nothing else for you. If you have anything else, let me know. You can either chat it or or whatever. And I will see you guys and gals tomorrow night. Be safe, and we'll talk to you then. Good night.